The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. America is now under the judgment of God. We're not uh, close to the judgment of God. We're now under the judgment of God. The signs of that are uh, not even debatable anymore. And I want to talk about the one sign that tells us that we've come to the end. There's, there's a testing and a time and a trial of the patience of God, but the patience of God has limits. With any society, historically, or whether it's our present day or whether it's throughout history, when perversion arrives at the schoolhouse door, then we have come to the end. We've come to the point where we've brought the judgment of God. We've, we've actually, as a nation, tested the honor of God and the character of God. Remember in the book of Proverbs, he warned us, he said, don't enter into the fields of the fatherless and don't remove the ancient landmarks because the Redeemer is mighty. And he says himself, I will rise up and I will contend for them. And so we as a nation now have challenged the honor of God. I have no doubt about that. We've challenged his word and we said, Lord, if you are who you are, then you prove that you prove that you are the one. This nation doesn't believe that God will rise up and defend the children. I happen to believe that he will, that his word and his honor are at stake. And as a nation, now the physical nation, the boundaries of the United States of America will probably stay the same, but the nation as we've known it is about to radically change, perhaps even disappear from its 400 year history and become something completely other. It's sad to have to say this, but I feel in my heart that we've, we've arrived at the place, and unless you think this ends in gloom and doom, it doesn't. There's, there's a remedy for the righteous, for those who can still hear the voice of God, for those who have a desire in a sense to maybe not the strength, but at least a desire to get up and get out of this incredibly immoral, confused time that we're now living in. I want to show you the way out. I want to start in Isaiah chapter one, where the people of God of Isaiah's day, now keep in mind, this was a nation, the nation of Israel was established to be a praise to God in the earth, as, as I believe America was. When you know the history, the true history of America, you know that it was a nation founded on the cornerstone of religious freedom, a nation that was dedicated by its, its early founders to the propagation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, to, to righteous and biblical living. That was the purpose of the nation, and we would strive to bring honor to his name in the earth. Just as the people of Israel were set apart in their day to bring a praise to the name of God in the earth. But there's something in the heart of man called sin. It's this, it's this innate desire in all of humanity to, to go our own way, to do our own thing, to establish our own borders, to create our own rules, to determine in our own hearts what is good and what is evil, what is right and what is wrong, in spite of what God says, to, to literally, as, as Adam and Eve once did, to, to get up from under the ways of God and the words of God and to create our own words, create our own righteousness, craft our own futures, and ultimately contrive our own utopian end, as, as, as foolish as it might be, that's what we do. And the prophet Isaiah, in speaking to the people of God of his time, the Lord says through him in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 4, Alas, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a brood of evildoers, children who are corruptors. They've forsaken the Lord. They've provoked to anger the Holy One of Israel. They've turned away backwards. Why should you be stricken again? You will revolt more and more. So the nation has gotten to the point in Isaiah's time of such rebellion against the ways and the words and the will of God. The God says, though I, though I, I try to get your attention, whether it's through enemies rising up that seemingly have more power than they should have, but whether it's through famine, whatever the situation is, when I strike you, it's, it's a discipline from God to get your attention, to bring you back to righteousness. And in a sense, he's saying through Isaiah, I've, I've done it over and over and over again, but all you do is revolt more and more and more and more. You've gotten to the point where you've become deeply resistant to the things of God as a nation. Now, I'm not suggesting everyone in the nation is unrighteous, so don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying there are not righteous churches in the country. I'm talking about the society as a whole. God is speaking about his people as a whole, as an entire society. It, the society of Isaiah's day, day has lost its purpose as we've lost ours in our generation, although there are still righteous people in it. Overall, the overall trajectory of the society is away from God. It wasn't debatable in Isaiah's time, and it's not debatable as well in our time. He says, the whole head is sick and the whole heart faints. From the sole of the foot, even to the head, there's no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. 
They've not been closed or bound up or soothed with ointment. In other words, God's saying, I was there with healing, but you would not come. I, I, I pleaded with you. I wanted to mend up your broken branches. I wanted to heal you in those places where there are breaches, but you wouldn't come. You chose your own way. Your country, listen to this condition of the nation in, in chapter 1, verse 7, and, and, and just put it as a, superimpose it as, in a sense over this nation today. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Strangers devour your land in your presence, and it is desolate, overthrown by strangers. So the daughter of Zion is left as a booth in a vineyard and as a hut in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. So the people of God, the, the righteous of God, are huddling together. That's the, the, the picture, I guess, that's presented here. The righteous of God are not permeating the nation any longer, but huddling together in groups and most likely trying to retain a sense of godliness in the midst of all of what's going on. And a besieged city, hammered on every side, spoken evil against. Unless the Lord of hosts had left to us a very small remnant, we would have become like Sodom, and we would have been made like Gomorrah. And, and so Isaiah's saying, or God's saying through Isaiah, it was, it was only the, the righteous that remained in the nation that kept it from going headlong into utter depravity. There's, there's a whole lot more happening when you and I, happening for good, when you and I choose to walk in right relationship with God. You have no idea that the restraining force of God's presence is within our lives. If we choose to walk with God, if we choose to read the Word of God, if we choose to pray, if we, if we turn away from that which defiles the name of Christ, there is an incredible pushback power against the powers of darkness in simply living a righteous life in this or any other generation. We look at our society today and it's not even debatable that order has given away to confusion. Our government is confused. Who can debate that? Our society has gone into confusion. Our morality is being swallowed by confusion. Our economy is in a confused state. Our military are losing their military might and are more concerned with titles and pronouns and such like. And even now, we're starting to experience uh, distribution and production of basic goods is now in jeopardy. And they're talking about food shortages in America. And people are starting to notice that it's, it's hard to buy cars, it's hard to get basic goods now, and it's going to get worse. People who are in the economic know in this country are warning us, they're telling us that it's going to get worse before, and they're not even talking about it getting better, they're just talking about maybe holding the standard and trying to stop the slide into the, the deprivation in a sense of basic goods and services that we come to take for granted over so many years. If you have the time, read Deuteronomy chapter 28 and listen to the warnings of God to his own people of what will happen if you choose to turn away from a living relationship with the living God. And everything we are experiencing today as a nation is in Deuteronomy chapter 28. As a matter of fact, it's unfolding in the sequence in which it is spoken. It's amazing, just read it, just study it, look at it. Look at the warnings of God. If you turn from me, this is what is going to happen. And you can see it, the, the order, we are actually following the same order of warning that is in Deuteronomy chapter 28, when God was warning his own people when he brought them out of captivity, was taking them into the land of promise, the place that they wanted to dwell in. He was taking them there and he was warning them of what was going to happen to them if they turned from him. Now the signs are everywhere and they're now undeniable. I don't think there's anybody with a rational mind who's a believer in Christ that can deny the reality of the fact that we are now under the judgment of God has been released on this nation. There's no doubt about that in my mind whatsoever. But the only one, the one that leads me to believe that we've tested the limit of God's patience is when perversion arrived at the schoolhouse door, attempting to make the innocents of this society partakers of grievous moral sin in this nation. When that happened, when they arrived at the door, that was the flashpoint of God's patience with former nations. And it is the flashpoint, in my opinion, of God's patience with this nation. What I'm saying tonight, I wanna to say it very, very clearly. I don't want anybody to misunderstand. I think the days of this nation are now numbered. I think we're test we have tested the patience of God. I don't know what the future is going to bring, but I do know that as the people of God, the scripture says we're not in darkness that we should be overtaken by a thief. We're not a people of fear. We've been given of God power. We've been given of God the ability to love even in unlovable times. We've been given a sound mind to know that the, the world is, is not meant to be a picnic for the Christian. 
we were left here, we were told there would be tribulation. We were told that the world would at one day hate all of us because of the name of Christ. We, we were foretold of these things. They should not be taking anybody by surprise. But we were also told that we were going to be given the strength to stand. We were going to be light set upon a hill that cannot be hidden. We were told that we were going to be made into the salt of the earth. We were going to be a testimony of the goodness and the greatness of our God, no matter what happens in our day and in our society. I believe that the standards of God are the same. When we push God to the limits that other societies have pushed God, we can expect to see the judgments of God increase. And then of course, as with the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, it comes to a point where God says it's gone on enough. This is, this is the, the level of depravity that society can come to when we turn away from God. And hum, human nature does not change. Human nature is the same. And this is where American society is heading today. We are heading wholesale at full speed into perversion. Deeper and darker perversion almost by the hour. You'll notice that perversion is at the door of the schoolhouse in America today. Drag queens reading stories to children in kindergarten unthinkable 10 15 years ago even 20 years ago un unthinkable that we would have to do this children being i in my opinion deliberately genderly gender confused by an agenda an evil agenda of perversion because ultimately a lot of these people want access to the children that's the bottom line of the whole thing they're now calling sexual perversion with children there's a book out that somebody wrote it's called minor attractor people minor attracted people now now it's no longer sexual perverts wanting after children but it's called minor attracted persons they're now changing the language we're living in an evil time folks let's make no mistake about this this is an evil day we're now living in god help us god be merciful to us there's nothing we can do as the people of god but live righteous lives now and call out to the lord and say god for the sake of the children we remember when Pharaoh went after the children, that's when God sent Moses. That's when he sent a word. That's when his power was made known. That's when a way was made out of an impossible captivity. That's when the people of God were brought out of this evil place and they were brought in to, even if it looked like a wilderness, it was still the plan and the pathway of God to bring them home to himself. It was at this point, and you'll see that all throughout history when the enemy goes after the children that's the end of that society that was the end of egypt as a world power it will be the end of any society that sets their hands against the fields of the fatherless because god has decreed himself to be a defender of the fatherless he said you move those landmarks and you enter into their fields and i will rise up and contend with you so anybody who's listening to this message today make no mistake about it as a nation we have challenged the very honor of god we have challenged the integrity of God in the time that we're now living in. You dare not rise up against the Holy God. And those who sneer at this message, you will soon stand before a Holy God and you will soon find out you don't play games with the Holy God. When he says he will defend the children, he will rise and he will defend the children. And so what are we to do as the people of God? Especially tonight, those that are online that are struggling, marriages that are falling apart, people that are suffering with addiction and depression, and you, you're, or even just mixture. There's so many of God's people that are, that are living in mixture at this time, as Lot was. Lot was a man who was in this society. The Bible describes him as righteous in the New Testament, but he had no effect, he had no influence because he was too mixed in the ways of that society. It was given to the thinking of the people of that time and the, probably the pursuits of many of the people and they, they just considered him. He wasn't really the light on a hill that he was supposed to be. He wasn't the voice that could challenge this encroaching darkness. But suddenly the messengers of God came to him and came to his house like I'm coming to your house tonight. Whether you like it or not, if you're online listening, I am in your house right now. I'm in your living room. I, wherever you are, I am there right now. The Lord has commissioned me to come to you. The Lord has commissioned me to warn the nation that we are on the edge of the judgment of Almighty God. But there's another thing. He has also sent me to everyone who's mixed, who's struggling, who doesn't know how to go forward. He says, I am going to send a message to you. And all I want you to do is reach out and take my hand, the Lord says, and let me lead you out. You may not be able to, but God can bring your wife, your husband, your daughters, your sons out of 
the judgment of this present day we're now living in and into the mercy of Almighty God through Jesus Christ. And you would say to me tonight, Pastor, what is it that I'm to do? It's simple. Even as you, you do this gesture as an act of faith, reach out your hand into the hand of God and say, Jesus, I, I can't get out. I can't save myself. I can't change myself. I can't change my family. But God, you can. I believe you can. You sent a message to me, and I believe the message that you've sent to me. So I'm asking you now, Lord Jesus Christ, to have mercy on me, have mercy on my family, have mercy on my children. That is what the Lord is asking you to do tonight. No more, no less than that. Reach out your hand and say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I can't save myself. Jesus, I believe that you died on a cross 2,000 years ago and you took the punishment for my sin upon yourself so that I could go free. Jesus Christ, I confess you as the Son of God. I confess you as my Savior. I confess you as the one who's reaching out to bring me to a place that I can't go to by myself. And I have decided that as your hand touches mine, I'm going to get up and I'm going to let you lead me where I need to go. I'm going to let you make me into the man or woman or young person that I need to be. I'm not going to try to do it on my own anymore because I can't. But oh God, with your hand in mine, I can. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can become the person that you have destined me to be. I can be brought out of captivity and into freedom in Jesus Christ. I can become a person that can make a difference in my generation. That is the cry of my heart. And let it be the cry of your heart tonight. My brother, my sister, you don't have to go down with this perishing world. Jesus Christ came to get you 2,000 years ago. He died on a cross. He made an open display of every power of hell that believes it has the right to take you and your children into captivity. He made an open show of it. And when he raised, when he was raised from the dead, he took your captivity captive and gave you the gift of eternal life. If you will reach out and take it to yourself, if you will put your hand in the hand of the Son of God. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. You don't have to go down with the ship. You understand, you don't have to perish with this society. You can have new life. You can have eternal life. You can have a meaningful life. Not just you, but your family. I believe that with all my heart. In the book of Acts, there's an old, dirty Philippian jailer who believed the gospel when Paul shared it with him and took Paul and Silas home. And not only was he saved that day, but his children, his wife, everybody was baptized. They all came to Christ because he opened his heart and opened his hand to the offer of God's forgiveness and the offer of change that God promises to those who set their affections on him. So that's the, my cry to you tonight, everyone who's listening online. You can turn to Christ and you can be forgiven and you can be free. You don't have to die in your sin. You don't have to sit on the side of the road and watch the society perish all around you. You can make a difference with Christ in your life and with your hand in the hand of God. Your life can make a profound difference in this generation, starting in your own home. Notice also in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers. It takes the grace of God to change us, folks. How can you be saved? if you're not willing to repent. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish.